Good evening. My name is Reeves Lehman, and I am the chair of the film and animation department at the School of Visual Arts, and I welcome you all here. Uh, just one little line of business. Turn your cell phones off or put them on vibrate, whatever works for you, and so that none of the films that we're going to be showing will be interrupted by that. Anyway, this is the opening night. Uh, we have two things going on. First, with uh, Randall Emmett, uh, one of our distinguished alumni. And then, as you saw outside, there's the film, The Adventures, which, uh, from the computer art department, uh, many of the effects were produced by, again, our alumni. So, uh, pretty happy about that. And there's going to be a number of things, as uh, you can imagine, this all weekend, all SVA alumni work. Uh, tomorrow, I believe, is some animation, uh, which makes me proud as well, <laughs> since I'm head of animation. <laughs> um, we have uh, tomorrow, uh, Rio 2, and then there's some SVA shorts, the animation series, and then there's Laws and the real girl, uh, and then uh, La Quimoneta, the journey of one American school bus, Beavis and Butthead, do Emeritus remember Beavis and Butthead, anybody? <laughs> so. And then on Sunday, there's some SVA live action uh, shorts, and, and then some, uh, a filmmaker by the name of Lynn Sheldon, will your sister's sister, and then Affluenza, which is uh, a film that was made by one of our uh, film students uh, back a while, but he seems to be doing okay. That's with Kevin Ash. Anyway, uh, we are very happy that uh, all these people, some of them came from California uh, to be here, and, and certainly Randall, as I said, uh, who is... <sighs> How do I describe Randall? Uh, I've never met anybody like Randall. <laughs> Randall uh, graduated in 1995, uh, and he was determined to be a producer. Uh, and when and that's when we didn't really have a producing track, but uh, he invented one at the school, <laughs> and he got to uh, uh, all the upperclassmen. Uh, to believe in him, and he just took it on to, to make their thesis films. And then he actually made, I gave him the green light to go ahead and make a feature uh, with one of the students. Um, and, and that turned out quite well. That was, that was his first feature that he produced. But he always, you know, was very, very resourceful and had a great personality. And one thing that can separate him from a lot of people, he was absolutely determined to succeed. That is in his blood and it's still there. This man has produced 90 movies since 1995. That's insane, really. I mean, he's, uh, who has that kind of energy? <laughs> who has that kind of drive? Randall, you know? Uh, he's often referred to as a real tough guy uh, in, in LA and Hollywood. Uh, which is okay. I mean, if you can produce that many films, uh, then you deserve that title. And you have to be tough because filmmaking is not an easy endeavor. And so I have to say, I'm very proud of him and we've been friends for many years. And now he's venturing into television. Uh, uh, and that's what we're going to see. Uh, his uh, first episode of uh, Power. Has anybody seen Power? No. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, hopefully, after you see this, then you'll become a fan uh, because the show has been green lighted for a second season. Uh, and that's great for because it's shot in New York. And there's a lot, a lot of roles uh, in, this, in this film and uh, in this TV series. And to be honest with you, that uh, uh, for what I know, d speaking with the uh, uh, New York Film Commissioner and the City Film Commissioner, they said very clearly that this city 
is going to be the digital media capital of the world. And they've been making all kinds of concessions to TV production and film production. There's so much going on here. It's just incredible. And slowly, as Hollywood sinks, New York rises, you know, so that's good for all of us. Certainly good for the film school, because uh, uh, there's a lot of internships and jobs and so forth. So uh, we're happy about that as well. Uh, so, I've been asked to say uh, uh, for the Q&A, uh, don't forget to add hashtag, I don't know what that is, but you, a lot of young people do, I guess, uh, uh, after school special to your Twitter, Twitter uh, Instagram, and Facebook posts. Uh, and please come back for the screenings tomorrow and Sunday, and bring your friends, you know, the, you can bring the whole family if you'd like. You know, it's, we want the theater uh, to uh, be here for everybody. We've always had that attitude here at this theater where we invite the public uh, uh, free of charge. And we do a lot, a lot of interesting things here from film to photography to fine arts and so forth. So sit back, relax, <laughs> and let's watch power. Okay. Well, I ask you, power, you know, which is harder, getting it or keeping it? <laughs> um, I want to introduce our, um, our guest, the executive producer of this television show. Um, as I said earlier, he's a uh, graduate of SVA, and during his career, which I'm sure was a long road <laughs> uh, to get where he is. And he's actually one of the top producers in Hollywood today. He's produced a number of films. Uh, one of my favorites uh, is The uh, Lone Survivor. That's one of my favorite films of his. But he's also done many, many movies with a lot of big stars, including Two Guns. These are some of the most recent ones, Two Guns. Uh, with Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg, Broken City with uh, Russell Crowe, thank you, <laughs> End of Watch, and, uh, and about 75 other films. Just amazing, amazing career. And now uh, he is going to be producing the next two films for Marty Scorsese. So uh, that's pretty exciting because... Uh, He's also one of our own here in New York. Uh, he has another film that's in pre-production. It's a bio, it's a bi biopic, as they refer to it, uh, on uh, Tupac. Uh, and uh, as I said, Marty Scorsese, a film that's being shot in Japan, Silence. Um, and Mr. Emmett just doesn't keep his feet on the ground very long because he's just flying all over the world. He's got so many productions going on, but he's a terrific guy, amazing guy, actually. And I'm glad not only that he's an alum of SEA, but that he's a friend. So I introduce Randall Emmett. <laughs> and he's being interviewed by one of our own, too, one of our students, and that's Zach Tolan. So, <laughs> So the floor is yours, guys. Let's go right over there. <laughs> You're hooked. All right. Hello, everyone. How's everyone tonight? Good. 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 Hi, I'm Zach. I'm going to be the moderator. This on? This on? Yeah, this on. OK. So Randall. You graduated from SVA in 1995, and you, as Reeve said, introduced the producing track. Now, how come, why, why did you do that? Why did you want producing? Um, well, uh, first of all, nice to meet everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I'm a little blunt and sometimes say a lot of bad language, so I apologize ahead. It's not, 
I wasn't raised this way. I just became this way somehow. It's dysfunctional, I guess. Um, I, uh, and at that time, I, I went to film school like everybody else with a passion to just be in the movie business. I had worked uh, the summer before as a PA on a movie called The Hard Way, blocking up traffic with many other PAs. And I just felt like I had found my calling, like I was going to be on a movie set. I didn't know where and I didn't know what if I had any talent, uh, what it was going to be. So when I got to SVA, <clears throat> the great thing is they let you take a directing class and a writing class and all these different classes. And uh, I just sucked at everything but putting it together. And I really enjoyed that whole process. And I enjoyed uh, being part of the creative process but not having all the weight on my shoulders like a director does or, or a writer when they create a story. And so I just kind of really got into managing the productions. And, and um, there wasn't a producing track, as Reeve says, but, but the school understood my obsession with this and just kind of tailored it for me so that I could <coughs> continue exploring that. And that's, Which is great. Yeah. That's great, you know. Um, so some would say that you are, well, I would say, you are a self-made man. You know, you have, you left SVA and you went off to Hollywood, right? What, can you tell us more about your journey like where you first started, you said you were a PA, and then where did you, what was the next step? Uh, after college. Yes, after college. Uh, after college. Um, I had done a feature, as Reeve said. Uh, the school was incredibly supportive. Back then, we didn't have digital, so doing a feature film was kind of crazy idea, you know, because it cost, you know, back then, 20 years even more, uh, 100,000 to do that. And uh, today you can take a digital camera and, and you know edit and all that. But we had a cut film and it was just a different time. But so I took that film, I moved to Los Angeles. I thought it was gonna be the next Jerry Bruckheimer, Scott Rudin, and then I was broke you know, in Los Angeles pretending I was a producer. Um, and uh, I, I had the skills to make films and I was very confident in that part of it. Uh, I had no idea just uh, about the business sense of raising money. And so I went out and just tried to raise money. I mean, that, that's what I did. And I started as an assistant to pay the bills uh, at a talent agency called ICM. And um, I worked for um, who became my best friend later on in life, uh, Mark Wahlberg, who back when I started with him was Marky Mark, and we'd get laughed at on the streets. So it was like, oh, I'm working for Marky Mark, or am I working for Mark Wahlberg? Because he didn't know which name he was going to be that she week. So. Um, when Boogie Nights happened, he was Mark Wahlberg. So, uh, but it was, uh, so I just, you know, just was finding my way. I didn't really have a, a roadmap. I just, <clears throat> people said, if you work in an agency, you'll learn a lot, which I did. Uh, I worked for Mark. And, um, and then after that, uh, I just kept trying to raise money. And I was failing really, really uh, well. And then eventually, uh, I got lucky and somebody believed in a project I had. Um, that Gus Van Sant executive produced back then right after Goodwill Hunting and gave us about a million and a half dollars to make my first lo uh, Hollywood feature, but second feature. And then you just skyrocketed. From well, no. That, well, then it was a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, I, then I, well, I didn't like being uh, poor and my car being repossessed and evicted from my apartment. I didn't like that lifestyle. It wasn't uh, what I saw myself. Um, so I was kind of obsessed with working forever and I said if I could ever make one movie and figure that out then hopefully I can make two and then when I got to two I was already working on five and six and when I got to six I was on 12 so I I, I just I guess it's the fear of you know them taking my car again and asking me to leave the apartment so I don't know so so now what kind of scripts like attract you I mean you have done you produced end of watch Rambo and you know, most recently, Lone Survivor, which was different than everything else that was in your filmography. What, like specifically, what attracted you to Lone Survivor? Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, where do I start? Lone Survivor is a movie for me that is probably, f I, I always say is like the pinnacle of my career, even though, you know, hopefully there's more of the, mo those moments, but I don't know if I'll ever be able to top that moment. It was, it was pretty simple how it happened. Mark and I were shooting, uh, this Denzel watched a movie called Two Guns, and he he called me, like uh, it was on the weekend I think I'll never forget. He called me like, and I was not taking his call because I was playing with my children, and he was stalking a lot of calls. And like the tenth call I took, and I'm like, what? And he's like, dude, you're doing this movie, Lone Survivor. It's gonna change your life. Get on a plane and go to fucking L. Excuse me, sorry. 
go to LA. We were, we were, we were sorry, uh, that's bad, real bad. I was in New Orleans and he said, go back to LA now and go meet Peter Berg. And that's literally was phone call. And I was like, what's the movie? And he's like, it's about this book. How do you not know it? I'm sending you the script. And I read the script that night and literally I booked a flight. I got Monday morning, I flew back to LA. Tuesday I met with Peter uh, and his partner, Sarah, and we sat in for four hours and they, they took me through the whole you know, journey of Lone Survivor and the, and the fallen soldiers and the sacrifice they made. And I was, I was in tears reading the script, but then I was in, almost in tears in the meeting because he was reading the autopsy reports and telling me about visiting the families. And I said to him in that conversation, which he uh, confirms in many of his interviews, I said, we're doing this movie. I don't care what it takes. I don't care how much money we might lose or not lose. I don't know. I haven't done the business model, nor do I give a shit. We're making this movie. And my father was also a Marine, so it was one of these things like, you know, you, you make for your father kind of thing. So, and then we started. The, we were like literally shooting six months later. Which is, it, it's a fantastic film. We watched it in um, my sound class, and we were just talking about it. Just the pacing of it, everything about it is, is just great. So, um so now, all right, let's talk TV, since we just, uh, we watched the, uh, you know, the Stars pilot and everything. So you have, this is like dipping your toes into television. Now, do you believe in the whole philosophy that television is the next big medium? Is that, is that why you sort of, you know, jumped in now? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm amazed by television. I watch a lot of TV um, because it's people that I don't really know. You know, the movie world, we're so competitive and... You know everybody, and oh, I could have had that movie, or I lost that movie. It's still, it's just you know you're just very driven and determined. But when I watch TV, I really escape, and I feel like television has gone to such a high level. Uh, you know, we have so many movie you know directors in television, and we, I mean, pretty much they all cross over now. They all blend. So I just felt like, wow, there's great television being made. I've made a lot of films, and it's something that I don't know, and I'm always trying to challenge myself and make something really fresh and inter interesting. And I, I've had a relationship with Curtis Jackson, 50 Cent, for a long time. Um, and I just thought, what could we do? You know, what could we do that would be different or special or, or cool and unique? And we came up with a concept with another producer named Mark Canton. Mm -hmm. And the three of us uh, came up with this concept. It was outlined pretty well, but we needed a really good showrunner because in television, that's what I was most intrigued by, that in the movie business, producers kind of have the upper hand, but in television, unless you're a writer, you don't have the upper hand. You're kind of a bystander to a certain degree. You know, you have a lot of saying casting and a lot of saying story and a lot of saying the key things, but once the show really gets underway, it's a writer's medium. So... I was really intrigued by that, and I, I liked that, and it also allowed me to keep making movies. So we found this incredible showrunner named Courtney Kemp, and she used a badass, and she just was like, we're going to do this, and this is how it's going to be, and she taught me a lot of things that I didn't know and, and uh, wrote the outline, uh, you know, ex extended the outline, mm -hmm. into, and then we went around to the networks, and I was, I, I didn't know what to expect, really, because I hadn't been through this process, and we got a phone call and like, oh, they're ordering a pilot. And I was like, is that good or is that bad? Is, should they? Should we be shooting already? Mm -hmm. You know. And and then they gave us notes that went on for like five months and or four months. I'm like, this is taking forever. Like, when do we start? And then all of a sudden they're like, they're ordering the whole series. And I was like, is that good? And they're like, that's the best. And I was like, oh, I love TV. So <laughs> that's kind. of, I mean, it was it was just this weird. And now process. season two is coming out. And now we started week. shooting this week, season two. Okay. So it's it's that's why you know it's been a lot. It's been an amazing ride. The people I've met uh, in the show are fantastic. The writers, you know, I've got to sit in the writers' room multiple times and watch their process, which is mm -hmm. so different than a feature process because you guys know a writer on a feature goes away for three months, writes a script, gives it to you. You write notes. They come back. It's back and forth, back and forth. There's no real relationship. But in television, I mean. There's 12 writers sitting in a room throwing ideas back and forth, and they're sticking. Some are not sticking, and it's just—it's an incredible, incredible medium. I love the creative synergy in TV, uh, and and it's it inspired me to go out and, and try to sell more shows. So now, so yeah, now you want to try to sort of do films and television as well. Yeah, I mean, I I think fi I mean film will always be my yeah. number one because it's it's what I know uh, the most. But sure, I mean we we definitely are out there pitching more shows now. Um, I, I like it because it, it's something that 
every day I learn something new. Like every day, you know, in the beginning, it was hard for me not to drop the hammer of the way I behave in my universe or the things that I know mm -hmm. instead of just saying, okay, I don't know shit and I'm just gonna start over like it's like my freshman year of college and mm -hmm. we're just gonna try to learn. And I, and I think once I did that, once I surrendered to the process of not knowing, it, I, I've had the best experience on this show. That's great. That's great. And I mean, now, of what I looked up, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you have eight films in the pipeline that you're going to be producing? Is that, or are there more? I don't know. You don't <laughs> know. <laughs> no, I don't know if it's eight, or um, I would say, I, I mean, this year uh, we're, we're uh, starting four, maybe, okay. yeah, for around four. We start shooting a couple in October, and then uh, we go into the Scorsese thing, which you mm -hmm. mentioned, which is obviously a highlight of, of my career. But uh, yeah, I mean, we'll have a lot in development, mm -hmm. but, but I'd say this year we'll probably, we're gonna do four more, and then next year I'm sure we'll do between four and six. It, it's, it's changing a lot for me because, you know, like I said, the desperation to make a living and, and not worry about those things of the lights being turned off. I've gotten away from that a little bit, and so now I'm trying to leave you know, some kind of mark in, mm -hmm. in my industry, and movies like Lone Survivor or working with Martin Scorsese um, are important moments for me, and I'm I'm looking for those moments a little more than what I was looking for the last 15 years. Let's well, say. Well, I mean, it must have been you must must have been amazing when you were you know in film school and you were watching his movies yeah. and everything, and yeah. then you finally now you're working with him and. Yeah, no, that it's I mean I, that's for sure the highlight of anybody, and I th you know what's amazing about Martin Scorsese is that everybody around him, everybody anybody that's ever made a movie with him that I know, acts like a, a, f a 14 year old little girl or boy, you know, when they get around him. It's like you walk in the room and you, all of a sudden you don't know shit. And, you know, what are you going to say? Marty, this is how you're going to do it. And you're going to listen to me. It's, you, you're like, whatever you say, sir, I'm bow down to you. So that's, I mean, that's, how, I, that's how I got the, the, the deal. I mean, because there were like 15 producers chasing these movies. And he asked me to come to New York. I, I flew here and I was perspiring and hyperventilating. And I just went in the room and he said, you know, why should I do these movies with you? You're... You know, and I said, because you're the man, and I'll do whatever you fucking say, basically. And mm -hmm. he's like, I love this kid. All right, give him the movie. <laughs> and that's, I mean, literally, with the conversation was maybe a little longer than that, but so it's that, that's been an incredible learning curve on every level. You know, being working with him. Mm -hmm. And you're now on pre-production for Silence, right? That's the one. Yeah, you guys are on yeah. Right we now. were we were gonna start shooting a. February 1st, in, we're shooting in Japan, but also Taipei, tai, Taiwan. Um, and w we've been over at Taiwan building and, and mm -hmm. doing all the prep. So a lot of prep work because a lot of set construction. Okay. Before I open up uh, the questions for the audience, I just wanted to ask, is there any advice that you have for like young filmmakers, you know, us at SVA or other filmmakers out there? Is there any advice that you have? Mm. Uh. I just say, I mean, as cliche as I, I usually say to this question, I just don't give up. You know, it's be as persistent as you can creatively come up with. You know, be as driven and determined. Mm -hmm. It's it's an easy phrase to say, oh, just go do it, don't give up, because that's that's the advice I got. But you know, I thought I would die if I didn't make movies. That's mentally probably where, if you rewind twenty years ago, that's probably how I felt because. You know, when I would drive down the street and see trailers and trucks, even when I see today, when I was going to the hotel and I see the CSC camera trucks, like I, I get anxiety. I'm like, why, why aren't I in that movie? Why is that my, my production? So I, I just, I love, I love the, the business. You know, I love creating and making films. And then at the end, you know, the lights go down. And, I, you know, I, when I have a movie in the theaters, I go to all the theaters. I, I drive around the whole weekend and sit in the theater and listen to people talk shit about my movies. That, that sucked. Why did I see that? I should have seen Mary Poppins. You know, I, I hear every comment, but I love it because we are making, you know, something for people to have an opinion and hopefully a good journey, sometimes not good. Um, but, but so I say, you know, you should get everything you want in this world, uh, in the film business, if that's where you want to be. But, a lot, you know, obviously there's a lot of sacrifice because it's a competitive industry, but... If you love it, you just you just can't stop. You know, it should it it should consume you until you get to the things that you want to achieve. So, well, I'm definitely going to take that advice. <laughs> no doubt about that. All right. So, who would like to ask the first question from the audience? There's a we have a microphone um, on both sides. So if you
Anybody? Yes, anybody. My work does have it, but would that be a brother in law? No, if, if you want if you want to We can hear you. Okay, so you ended the last episode of Power with a big, I cannot wait to see what the next episode is. So good job. Thank you. Um, we got really crazy at the end you of season You really one. did. It, seemed, it <laughs> seemed like he lost pretty much everything. <laughs> pretty much. I mean, even the big contract he had with the you know, yeah. magazine, that was just crazy. So what I want to ask you is, what can we look forward to next season? I know you can't tell us every single thing, and really I'm wondering, how do you keep that going? But what can we expect for the for this next season that you guys are shooting? Well, uh, thank you. And um, I think that now that we've established the characters and gotten people to really invest in this journey, because I've learned in TV, you know, we're setting up an audience to invest. And now that you're invested, like I get invested in TV shows, now we can really have fun, let loose. And I could say, like you said, I, I would get destroyed if I give you any real information, um, because Stars is much bigger than I am. But I will say uh, it is one of the best first three episodes I've read out of everything I've seen in season two. It just gets insane and crazy, and everything's on the line for everybody, and everybody's fucking everybody over, basically. So it's, it's cool. That's it. I'm so, I, I would love to. I, I mean, I would love to go have coffee with you and tell you everything, but I just, I just will get destroyed. <laughs> They've already given me a warning when I came here to shut my mouth. So, uh, but yeah. Okay. Yes. Good evening. Hello. Oh, excuse me. Um, Mr. Emmett, my name is Terra Nova Washington. Hi, Zach. Hello. So when I found that you were going to be here, I was more than ecstatic because I always wanted to meet you because I just read that you were just such a wonderful person. Thank and you. I'm not just blowing smoke. Thank and you. And then hearing even more, I happen to be a writer. And in addition to being a writer, you know, God has blessed me with so many uh, abilities to uh, conceptualize ideas, and I do have a lot of concepts and some scripts. And I presently happen to have, be in court right now with my landlord trying to evict me as a writer. And I say that because all I'm asking is I would like an opportunity to meet with you okay. and possibly sit and be like the chocolate version of you because you <laughs> love film, but I love writing. And I actually am really good at this, love what I do. You, you, you're sold. Got it. No problem. Thank you, sir. Okay. You can set it up through Reeves and we'll, we'll get together. No problem. All right. We got, we got a couple more. Hi. Hi. I'm Jen London. Um, I'm a musician, actually. Um, I'm not affiliated with SBA, uh, but I'm also, uh, I wrote a memoir about uh, overcoming adversity. I'm in the process of writing a script for it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I guess my question is, um, I've been going to some film festivals, um, networking with some people thus far. In terms of um, once I'm finished with the script and sending it out to production companies, uh, like the music industry will not take something unsolicited, you know, uh, and publishing too. So I, I don't know if production companies will look at a script or do you know? I mean, I, I, you're talking about a feature length script. Yes. Yeah. Um, sure. There are companies definitely that will take on solicit, and there are companies that won't. It just depends on like the level that they are. Um, I think also reaching out to younger agents is also a very quick fast track because, and I don't mean when when I say that a lot of people say, "Oh, William Moore, CA are not going to take my script. They're not going to take my phone call." But there are 25 other agencies that have kids right out of college, right, that are 25 or 27, 28 junior agents or departmental agents where they're between being an assistant and being an agent. And generally, being in New York or LA, you always know people, you know, who know people, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that can at least get your script read. And I would definitely recommend trying to get some coverage on your script to give you at least a little feedback to know, you know, it, it, you know, here's maybe where the strengths are, maybe here's, you know, where some weaknesses are, and maybe get a couple opinions and coverage so that you can compare the three different opinions because a lot of times you'll find three weaknesses all similar and then you can kind of work on that before it really goes out. But I would say really be aggressive with agencies because, mm -hmm. and there are tons of them, whether it be Paradigm or Gersh or 
Buckwald. I mean, there's a lot of these great agencies that you can get people on the phone. It's not, you just got to pick up the phone and, and, and say, you know, Randall Emmett said I should call. I mean, I made up all types of shit when I had to get through doors. So you don't want to know my... No, I've been known to do things yeah, like that. So if, you do, if you're that, if you're yeah. that, then it'll happen. And that's how I got, I mean, my first feature, you know, I got made because uh, I called up Daryl Hannah's manager 20 years ago, and I said I had all the money in the bank, and they're like, really? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to make you an offer. And I typed up on my computer of the couch I was sleeping on at my friend's house, and I sent it, and Daryl Hannah read it and loved it, and I'm like, all right. And then I went out and right. shopped it for money, and I that's how I got the movie made. I mean, right. so just right. whatever. This is what I have to say, and, and I'm like the politically incorrect version of everybody else in Hollywood. So whatever it fucking takes is right. what I say. Right. As long as you're not committing a crime. <laughs> All right, thanks. How you doing? My name's Chase. Um, I actually was going to ask you more about elaborating on your first feature, but uh, you just did, kind of. So um, I guess, yeah, how, di if you ever directed or wrote anything and how that turned out and maybe just... Um, how you got people to like believe in you, even yeah. if you didn't really make much, and yeah. just maybe elaborate a little uh, more on that. Uh, in terms of directing, I've never directed anything yet. Although uh, there's this little thing in the back of my head that says, you know, maybe I should go direct. I don't know something. It keeps saying to me, but I I want to wait like another 15 years uh, because I think I'm still too immature. Uh, so. But in terms of um, getting people to believe in you, that's something I'm obviously well aware of because I do it every day. Um, even today, I was on the phone with one of my investors who was waffling on a piece that he's in putting into a movie, and I had to sit for an hour on the phone before I got on the plane and convince him that, you know, that's the wrong decision. Um, so convincing people to uh, invest with you when you're just starting out is obviously really hard. But there's also something that's... Um, I think inspiring about youth, you know, I think people really like that. Um, they still like that I act like I'm 21, even though I'm 43. Um, so I, you just gotta, you just gotta be passionate. I'd also say that you guys are lucky, the whole room, to be in an age of digital. You know, to, yeah. when I started, it sucked because you had to shoot on 16. I mean, it was great and it sucked, but um, right. is today, you know, you can do a movie for a hundred thousand dollars and. You know, you can go to a tax, I'm giving you, making up my own story here, but you could go to, you know, a tax incentive state, get, you know, 30% of 100, so now you're down to 70. You know, you can, there's a million actors that are not working that you could right. make offers to smaller actors and get a little name value and maybe have a little foreign pop to that deal and maybe sell the foreign for 30 or 40 grand and then you only have to raise the balance. So, you know, I just think, you know, if you, if you're obsessive and passionate, that you'll find those people, but yet, but you have to own it. Like, you, like you're, even on my first feature that I did for seventy six thousand dollars, I went around telling family, friends, friends of friends, you know, I'm going to be the next big thing, and here's your moment. And if you, yeah. if you put that money in today, yeah. I will remember it forever. And all those people have come back, right. and I have to give them premiere tickets. I have to send them to the sets. I'm shooting a movie in uh, uh, Alabama with De Niro in October. Uh, one of my investors from my second movie ever is flying in to get a picture with Bob. Wow. So I'm honorable when I say I will do, and you might have to own that for 20 years, but right. whatever it takes to get it done. Right. Yeah. yeah. Anyone from this side of the room? Just so we can be fair. Uh, hi. Um, I'm going to have to admit, I'm actually, can, does this work? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little nervous. So, yeah. Oh, um, it's okay. Hi. We're um, all nervous. You were, I remember you, you showed up for uh, the Dusties this May, and um, I was just like, I was like, oh, my God, it's the guy from Lone Survivor. I don't, I don't know what to do. Um, I'm actually, um, I actually also have a film that I wrote, and um, well, the other individual actually also beat me to a punch, but I want to know if maybe there was a chance I could meet with you also, and then maybe... I can yeah, here's what, here's what we're going to do, because I, I 100%, and thank you very much for the kind words, because that means a lot, because that's the first movie in my career that I feel like I earned a moment in, in time, so that really means a lot to me. I am going to set up a day in New York when I'm back in two weeks, and I'll do it through Reeves, and we'll, I'll just spend two hours at the school, and we'll, we'll just do private one-on-ones with whoever wants to, from this room only, who wants to sit with me. Reeves, you'll coordinate that for me? 
Or please. All right. So so I'll I'll spend time with you. I'll spend time with you. And if anybody else wants to have private time, just go through. Seriously, I'll, if it's two, Reeves knows. When I say something, I will do it. And I will definitely spend two or three hours at the school. And we'll get whoever needs to have some just questions or things. And I'll bring my development guy. And he'll be there, too. And we can just have a little session to, to get through that. But um, Also, just one more thing. I don't want to like hog anybody's time up. But um, how did you get the whole like logistics to like put together a war film. I feel like war films kind of need to be treated differently. Yeah, that's how, a great how, how did you, you know, how, how did that come together? Um, so Lone Survivor was definitely something different than I'd ever done um, because first there's a thing called MAP when you make a, a war movie and you're either a military approved project or you're not. So the United States government has to decide the Pentagon and other higher ups if you're gonna be approved by our country to be supported by our country's military. We were very lucky because of Marcus Luttrell that they approved us immediately. And then it's just, it's like a huge planning with the military and all of our military consultants. And then Peter Berg, who had really lived, who had gone to Afghanistan for a month with the SEALs, who had spent a tremendous amount of time um, and just used all the Navy SEAL consultants and we just, the planning was immense. You know, we got a lot of military equipment from the government, which saved us a ton of money. We could have never made the movie for, for what we made it for had we not had that. Um, and it was a lot of negotiating, you know, a lot of fighting in the beginning because Peter wanted to shoot at the top of a 14,000 foot mountain with our crew, who probably hasn't worked out in 10 years. Um, and the actors, you know, half of them were like, yeah, let's go do it. And the other one was like, is he crazy? We're gonna have altitude sickness. and. It was, it was just insane, the whole thing. But once we figured it out, we shot probably maybe 10 days at the top of the mountain at high altitude, and the rest was all done in the base of New Mexico. But it was a, it, it, it really, I mean, I could go on for two hours, but it's, it was an incredible undertaking to be part of it was unbelievable. And the detail that went into putting this movie together, Peter Berg, who is my hero for sure, spent every waking minute of his life making sure, and along with Marcus Luttrell, making sure that this movie was was honest and true and real. And I, I hope that that comes across. So. Okay, well, one last thing. Um, how do you do research for like figuring out how, like, you know, what guns they used? Uh, we, have, we have an armor uh, that, that, that's his job to make sure that the guns are accurate um, to the time when, when, we, when the movie, when the incident happened. Um, also, we had uh, technical consultants from the Navy, about 14 of them, real SEALs, both current and former, who also were there to make sure. I mean, these actors, if they put their backpack on wrong, if their gun was the wrong way, if, if it, when they were loading the ammunition, you know, just in those scenes, everything was, was really calculated, and they were obsessive to make sure that they, they were honest. So, yeah. A lot of a lot of planning and a lot of uh, of of technical consultant work was done between the cast and and the crew. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. All right, so we're gonna head over to this side. Uh, hi, what's going on? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was wondering because they say that there are like two hubs uh, in the states for like film. It's like it's New York and then L. A. Um, but you went to L. A. So I was wondering, is there, I guess, one where you would say there's more opportunity, or does it really not matter? Do you make your own? Or? Oh, this is a tricky question. It's a great right. question. Uh, it's the question for anybody that didn't hear was just, you know, between New York and L.A., why L.A. or why New York? This is an ongoing debate between the East Coast and West Coast for a long time. And, uh, you know, me personally, and I love New York, <laughs> Reeves, <laughs> I love New York. I think if you're going to be in the movie business, it's very hard to start here. I think you can come back here and be utterly successful and really build the community here. And we have a ton of people that do that. I just think the studios are all in LA. The agencies are all in LA. I mean, yeah, everybody has offices here, but I'm, you know, the majority. And then you've got every foreign distribution company in Los Angeles. You've got, um, you know, it, it's just, it's three miles down the road to each of these places, and it's very easy to take meetings when you're in Los Angeles, and I think there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, I'm not gonna tell anybody that you can't be successful anywhere, because there are people like Robert Rodriguez who are successful in Texas, you know? So I just think that 
Uh, if you're starting out in the business, you know, I personally always tell people you should go to Los Angeles to start. And then once you start to understand the business or, or build your platform a little bit and you want to go back to New York, then you should go back to New York and, and continue that uh, in, New York, in New York. So, but, but it's definitely, in my opinion, easier in Los Angeles. But I like New York. I know. Most New Yorkers are never going to Los Angeles. So it doesn't matter whether I say this or not. I, uh, because I like, I like if you're a New Yorker, you're not leaving this city. And I understand that. Because there are a lot of days I'm like, LA it sucks. And I just want to go have good pizza and good people and good culture and great museums. And uh, just bashing my own city. But it is what it is. Okay. Well, no. Um, uh, quickly, uh, two years ago I went with uh, Sal, uh, the director of operations of our department, to uh, – we did an SVA in L.A. program. Yeah. And I went – and that was the first time I ever met you yeah. in your office and everything. And I stuck out like a sore thumb because I'm, I'm Mr. Ty in the khakis. <laughs> and everyone is all laid back. And I was just like, oh, this is a different sort of uh, place. But Yeah, this is like dressed up for me just so everybody knows. I put on my best <laughs> outfit today, so – all right, sir. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Wasatsky. I'm the director of the film and TV program at Bronx Community College. I'm actually from the Bronx, so yeah, I nice stayed in you. the Bronx. <laughs> nice um, to meet you. But I do want to uh, tell you that my students have been watching the series all summer. I have my son here. He, he loves the series. And they've compared the characters to, to the same characters in The Godfather and The Sopranos. They just love the characters. At oh, the end great. of the class, they, they said, but they run a drug cartel at night. But they love the yeah. honesty. And one of the things that came up yesterday was you know, Barack Obama's favorite film is The Godfather. And then someone said, I bet you he loves power. <laughs> you know? So here's my question for you about the directors, George Tillman, Hemingway, John Coles. Mm -hmm. How do you, how, in the first eight shows, you've kept this great continuity, this great look, this great feel. It feels like it's just one big movie. Mm -hmm. What's your involvement with picking those directors, selecting them, and keeping that that look and that sound and that feel for well, the show? Well, thank you very much. And um, and, and that I would say that's probably between directors, cast, and and the feel. You know, I'm really involved in that with my three other executive producers. Um, I I love film directors. You know, so I, you know there was it was there was obviously uh, George Tillman. You know, specifically and Hemingway, who I who I love. You know, you sit down with these guys and they come in with a really strong vision. They understand, you know, what you're trying to convey. And, and you're, you're just basically, you're asking them after they've read the, the episode, you know, what do you see for these characters? Where do you see them going? And some people come in and they're talking about bananas and you're trying to make oranges, you know. And some guys come in and they just nail it. And I, I don't know, maybe that's too generic, but, you know, there's just a thing that certain directors walk in and they just say everything with a passion. Like Hemingway, I mean, he's obsessed. You know, he's a real filmmaker. And Tillman, too. You know, they're just... Um, so, but then, of course, you also have the network and, you know, you have the showrunner, Courtney, who Courtney is never going to let a director come into our house and not carry the consistency of of these characters that she is so obsessed with, I mean, at the highest level. So you have a showrunner who every week is sitting in a room writing story with the other writers, and she's not going to let anybody come in and ruin her moment. So a lot of times, Courtney will come to us and say, have you guys lost your fucking minds? Or, you know, not over my dead body. I've, I've heard it all. So, But at the end of the day, she's only fighting for the show to look the way it does and feel the way it does and the texture of the whole thing. And I, I think we've just been really lucky that we've kept it's just the also, I think we're like this 300 pound gorilla that we've been in a cage the first season, you know, trying to set the show up. And now what you're going to see in season two is, is just insanity. It's great though. Well, congratulations. I hope you win a ton of Emmys. <laughs> Thank you get you. six seasons. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're going to take one more question before we wrap up. Oh. Hello. I'm Mia Dene. I am a director and a film blogger of TheRealReality.com. It's a little plug for y'all. <laughs> um, so my question is for you know young people that are trying to break into the industry that are you know just so involved with so many things. How do you manage um, your time and your work? Like, what are some things that you do that like actually helps you to get all this work done? And also, what is um, a big business model of yours? What I do. I'm sorry. Did I not explain? The no, no. You were very, very clear, and you, and and I'm a little slower than most. So <laughs> just, just, just guide me a little more, because I could rant and rave for like okay. an hour on that question. So, so just get, are you um, 
are you like a are you good at like being um I can't think of the word right now. I'm sorry. Um so are you one of those people that's good at working under pressure or are you yes. somebody yes. okay? Yeah, I mean I think uh, I'll try it and then if I go off course you just bring me back. But I basically I mean I'm very OCD with something. Like that's my gift, I would say. Probably any medication, but I've just never taken it because Einstein didn't take it. Not that I'm Einstein or think I'm anywhere close. I'm dumb as they come. I'm just really good at one thing, making movies. But I will say that I am so OCD about a movie. So when I when I when I green light something, like a lot of people have like a hundred different interests. Like people I meet all the time, they'll say, you know, I'm a tap dancer, but I want to make a movie, but I also want to go to the moon. And I think that's awesome. I can only do one thing. Otherwise, I get confused. So I take a script and I read it, and all I know how to do from that moment that I read that script is who's going to be the director? How, do, how much money is this going to cost? Where do I get that money? What kind of actors are we going to put in this movie to make sure that money is supported? And so I just go into this kind of really obsessive thing, but a very focused driven, calculated kind of effort. So for me, I stay really, really kind of focused the minute I start a movie until the movie's uh, finished. Um, I'm also good at, I would say, I'm really good at also torturing people um, till they give me what I want. You know, I would say if you ask people, agents and managers and, and studio executives, um, if they don't call me back within an hour, then I'll call them 10 times. So it just becomes basically easier to take my call than to ignore me. So just, it, I'd rather get a no and move on than you know, wait three weeks. I'm not good at I'm very impatient. How, um, how does so. one tap dance on the moon? There are some people that are talking about it, I've heard. <laughs> Thank okay. you. You're welcome. All right, so, well, I have one final question just because I'm curious, and I always ask this. What's your favorite film? Or one of them? I, I'd say one of them is uh, Scarface. It's probably you know one that had a lot of, and Godfather, you know, movies of mm -hmm. that tone had a lot of influence on me. Um, I go lighter too at times, but if my mother's in the audience, I go lighter. But right now, that's, okay. that's, that's I mean, Scarface probably had the, one of the biggest impacts on me because I saw it at, at a young age. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so violent and crazy and epic in every way. So, you know, I bought every Scarface classic poster. You yeah, know, my mom let me watch Jaws at five. Why would, <laughs> why would you do that? Why? <laughs> you. Okay, well, I'm yeah. going to wrap this up. Yep. But uh, thank you, Randall, for coming out. Thank you, guys. I appreciate out. it.